and this is the right way. And somebody else gets up, and he may be a rather highbrow Catholic, and say, well, God has given the Spirit through all the traditions, but ours is the most refined and mature. And then somebody comes along and says, well, as I said, they're all equally revelations of the divine. And in seeing this, of course, I'm much more tolerant than you are. <laughs> you see how that game is going to work? See, I could take this position. Supposing you regard me as some sort of a guru. And you know how gurus hate each other. They're always putting each other down. And I could say, well, I don't put other gurus down. See, that outwits all of them. <laughs> See, we're always doing that. We're always finding a way to be one up. And by the most incredibly subtle means. So you see that, you see? And you say, I realize I'm always doing that. Now tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. Shall I put it like that? We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> We white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You had better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. <laughs> and having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. See, because sometimes doing good to others, and even doing good to oneself, is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. So we don't know. It's like the problem of geneticists which they face today. I went to a meeting of geneticists not so long ago where they gathered in a group of philosophers and theologians and said, now look here, we need help. We now are on the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character uh, we would want to have. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want, just tell us what kind of human beings ought we to breed. So, I said, how will those of us who are genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be? Because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. It may be like, for example, this new kind of high-yield grain which is made, and uh, which is becoming ecologically destructive. W when we interfere with the processes of nature and breed efficient plants and efficient animals, there's always some way in which we have to pay for it. 
And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. We could have a plague of virtuous people. <laughs> Do you realize that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous. It does its thing. But in crowds, they're awful. Like a crowd of ants or locusts on the rampage. They're all perfectly good animals, but it's just too much. I could imagine a perfectly pestiferous mass of a million saints. <laughs> so I said to these people, look, there's the only thing you can do. Just be sure that a vast variety of human beings is maintained. Don't please breed us down to a few excellent types. Excellent for what? We never know how circumstances are going to change and how our need for different kinds of people changes. <laughs>